A spoiler alert, this is my absolute top favorite server rack battery. And I'm gonna show you exactly why. You guys have been asking for my previous video when I reviewed the Vader battery for me to do an expansion video on how I put it all together. Well, this is that video. I'm gonna show you all the specs of this battery and show you exactly why it's my favorite server rack battery and how it compares to the other units on the market. But beware, there are three red flags you need to be aware of with this battery before you make a decision on purchasing it. My name is Ben, this is the Minuteman Solar YouTube channel. I truly appreciate you being here. We're gonna tear into this and I'm gonna show you all the cool insides of this. First of all, this is considered a 51.2 volt or 48 volt battery. With inside each battery is 100 amp hours of cells. There are 16 cells arranged in here that I'm going to show you. And once you put that all together, it's basically a 51.2 volt battery. Voltage has a range, which means you may actually see upwards of 54 volts or as low as 49 volts or different voltages through the whole system. And that's completely normal. Now real quick, there are a few things that set the Vader battery apart from many other server rack batteries on the market. One of those being that it doesn't use a coulomb meter to track exactly how many amps and amp hours have passed through the cables, but instead it relies just on voltage. Now, the beauty is with pretty much all of the EG4 inverters, whether it's the 3000, the 6000, the 12000, whatever it is, as long as you operate them in lead acid mode, you can still get all the same benefits of having battery communication without having to have battery communication. In fact, a lot of people use their batteries without any communication so that they don't have to go through the hassle of setting it up just because you can use the voltage and it works just fine because these are such high amp hour batteries. If you try to do the same thing with a really small battery, because voltage fluctuates depending on how hard it's being used, that would not be as good of a deal, but because these are large batteries, it's not a problem at all. Now in many different tests, the Vader battery was actually able to pull anywhere from four to 5% more than the rated output of the battery. It consistently pulled 104 to 105 amp hours while doing low and heavy duty discharges. The EG4 batteries don't even consistently pull 100 amp hours every single time. And as well, the eco-worthy battery which is the cheapest server rack battery on the market right now, doesn't consistently pull 100 amp hours. And both of those even have communication options on the battery. So that's one of the benefits of having a Vader battery is you still get all the features you want using it with an inverter, but you also get the extra bonus of having more capacity than the rated capacity. Now it's pretty typical to spend an extra 75 to $100 just to get a screen like this, but it's built in with the Vader battery. You have multiple pages. You can use the power button to scroll through them or it, because it's touchscreen, you can just press the page and it gives you all the information you want. So I get the state of charge and what's happening with the battery it says that it's discharging right now. And that's because it's sending energy to the other batteries below. This ring goes from red to yellow to green, depending on the state of charge. So at a glance, it's really easy to see what state of charge you're at. So I can see the amps going in or out, the voltage of the battery, the internal temperature of the cells, which is awesome, as well as the time to empty or the time to full. Now on page two, you have the control of being able to turn off discharging or turn off charging. But my favorite thing about this page is it shows how many cycles. I've put over 50 cycles just on this new battery. This is the newest design from Vader. And this has been running one of my crypto miners making a side income for me nonstop 24 seven. You can see that the temperature range has been really good on the battery. And on page three, we can actually see down to the very fine detail, the difference between all the battery cells. The green is gonna be your highest voltage cell and the blue is gonna be your lowest voltage cell. And we can see that there are only four millivolts difference between the highest and the lowest cell, which is incredible balance. One of the reasons this is such a great feature to have on any battery is let's say battery number 12, for some reason was at 2700 millivolts. We would know that there's a major issue with that cell and then we can actually go inside the battery, pull that cell and replace it without having to do any major work to the whole battery itself. Now this has all of the over voltage, under voltage, high temperature, low temperature protection, everything that you'd want inside. And we're gonna open this up right now, but to make sure we're being safe, all I have to do is flip this breaker on all of these batteries. And that ensures that there is no chance of me getting electrocuted while working on this. And it's 16 Phillips screws around the edge. And then we're gonna need a half inch socket for the inside. Go ahead and pull off the top here. Now you'll notice how much padding is underneath here. We're gonna talk about that in just a second with all of the thickness here. There's this protective sleeve above the cells and a lot of dead space in front of it for all the terminal connectors. I'm gonna use the Phillips to get these last four screws out. Woo! Then a half inch socket for these bars. 
And just like that, we have full access to everything underneath. We can see we have these really heavy duty steel bars that hold the batteries into place. Next, we can see that the terminals for each battery is actually using a flange nut instead of being welded on. This is a major benefit because just like I mentioned before, if for some reason this battery cell has an issue, we can simply undo these bars, undo all of these bolts and these bus bars here, pull that battery out and replace it with a brand new cell very affordably. These are actually EVE cells, that's EVE, which is a very high grade lithium iron phosphate cell. You're easily gonna get 6,000 cycles out of these before you can even notice any degradation. These openings here are for these pressure relief valves on the battery. That way if there's any issue, that pressure can escape very easily. There's a lot of dead space above the batteries here as a safety measure in case anything gets dropped on it. We have a temperature sensor here. We have another one up here. And I don't know where the third one is, but supposedly there are three temperature sensors within here. All of the wires to the BMS, which is the battery management system, are encapsulated. So that way there's no risk of these getting beat up over time and wearing, and then causing a short inside of here. We have our main positive here, our main negative here. The only thing that I'm really seeing that I dislike a lot is we have these quality control marks here. They basically use a Sharpie and they make a mark across the top of the bolt in order to look at a glance to see if the bolt is coming undone. You find the same thing on roller coasters all the time, but I'm not seeing this blue mark transferring down from the top of the terminal post down to the sides of the nuts here. Technically, this mark should be going down to at least one side, so it's easy to see at a glance if anything's coming loose. And then the other really nice thing that I'm seeing is that we have this hump here in the bus bar between the batteries, and that allows for expansion and contraction of the cells as they get hot and cool and use a lot of power and discharge quickly and recharge quickly to make sure that this has as much flex in it as possible. And you can't tell from the camera angle, but there's actually the, the yellow padding that goes in between the cells. I can see that from up here, so I don't see anything wrong with this. This looks like an extremely well put together battery. Now on the BMS here, this is just a standard JBD BMS. These are pretty common and you can order them online. The reason I like that so much is because in the event of an EMP or a severe over voltage attack on a battery like this, the BMS is going to be the main thing that fails. The BMS controls all the batteries to make sure that they're staying balanced. So you can easily go buy more of these JBD BMSs, keep them inside of a Tech Protect Faraday bag. You can just find that at techprotectbag.com. And then in the worst case scenario, if there's ever a failure of this BMS, you can swap it out and easily keep this whole battery going. The screen can also be easily purchased and replaced because that is something else that would also go out. Some of the reviews had mentioned that the screws that hold on these terminal covers were loose. Mine have not been loose on any of my batteries, but if you needed to tighten up the screws that hold on this covering or the base of this terminal post, that can be controlled inside here, either with some Loctite for these little screws and by adding another little nut to the back or just by getting inside here and tightening it all. Now we get into the few downsides of this battery. Remember how I talked about how much space was on the top here? Well, this battery measures seven inches tall and normally that's not really a bother. So because it's seven inches tall, it doesn't fit on any existing battery rack or a server rack like you see here. I've retrofitted this eco-worthy rack just to be able to hold these Vader batteries. I also bought the EG4 battery rack, which is over a thousand dollars because I thought these batteries would fit in it and they don't. So red flag number one is that because these are so tall, they do not fit on an existing rack and Vader doesn't have their own rack available. So in the meantime, the best thing you can do is put it on something like a heavy duty furniture dolly, strap it all together, and that's really all you can do. Red flag number two has to do with the cables that you need in order to connect to an inverter. This is a two aught cable, meaning it's two slash zero. Generally speaking, this is what you want for anything around six to 8,000 watts of load of what you're gonna be running off of your inverter. So for something like the 6,000 XP, this is usually the right cable. The problem is this cable end rate here does not fit inside the housing for this battery. So I can't use this cable unless I somehow get a skinnier terminal end here. And that can be really tricky to find. Additionally, using this with a 12,000 XP off-grid inverter, which is enough to really run a house quite easily, I would want to jump up to a four aught cable and still I run into the same problem that they're not gonna fit in there. So that's red flag number two. And then red flag number three, these are not UL listed. Now we see how good a quality these are on the inside, how well you can manage the cells in case there's any issue at all. That doesn't mean that these will be passed or acceptable for grid connection. 
You can use these in any off-grid setup, whether it's just making a backup system like this and you run your house off of an interlock switch, that's perfectly fine. You're gonna run this in an RV, not a problem. Off-grid cabin, not a problem. But if you wanna have what's called net metering, which is a grid connection where your excess energy goes back onto the grid and then you get a credit from your power company to offset your bill, these will not pass for that. The extra tidbit of that is all of your battery cables have to be encapsulated. That's why with the EG4 batteries, which are UL listed, their entire battery cabinet makes sure that all the cables are protected. And that's one of the things that you have to have in order to pass your inspection for grid tied power. And not necessarily a red flag, but a personal gripe of mine is that they provide these 18 inch long six gauge wires. This is gonna work perfectly fine for a whole stack like this, but I personally like to have all of my cables as neat as possible. And because this is so long, it's a little tricky to have them neat. And even though I'm doing it, it's never a good idea to have a 90 degree corner sitting on the edge of a cable. So rather than having an 18 inch long six gauge cable, I would prefer a nine inch long four gauge cable just to make sure that this thing's overbuilt a little bit and then it makes it a lot easier with the battery management. The one upside to having a longer cable is if for any reason I did not have these batteries stacked up right on top of each other and I had a decent amount of space between them, say maybe like in an RV, it's the only way I can set the batteries in there, then it's nice to have the extra cable. But I think that should be left up to the customer in order to upgrade the cable if they need it in a situation like that. Now, even though these aren't UL listed batteries like the EG4 ones, you still can use the EG4 charge verter, which means you can charge at up to five kilowatts into a whole battery stack like this. So here I've got six batteries, which means it would take me about six hours to completely charge this whole battery bank. Now you can hear these fans running behind me. That's because I do a little bit of crypto mining, like Bitcoin mining here at my house. It's a little side income that I do. And that's what I use my excess solar for rather than getting credits from my power company, because I get a lot better return on investment getting Bitcoin than I do for my power company. That said, if I'm not running crypto miners here at my house, I only use an average of 20 to 30 kilowatt hours a day. And this whole stack is 30 kilowatt hours. So if grid power was down and the sun was not shining and I needed to recharge my battery bank, I could do it in about eight or nine hours while still running my house off of a heavy duty gas generator. And so by doing that for say eight hours, I would get upwards of 30 hours of runtime off of the batteries instead of having to run my gas generator that long. So for places that are prone to natural disasters, this is an incredible setup paired with a large gas generator and the charge verter. Even if you only have one battery, each battery is capable of outputting 100 amps and inputting 100 amps, which just means five kilowatts or 5,000 watts. And because it can charge at 100 amps, that means I can also put a lot of solar into it to quickly recharge. Now I've just been using this with this 3000 watt inverter because I use this for crypto mining, but this could seriously run my whole house. If you guys wanna see a video where I make a battery stack like this, run my entire house for an extended period of time, comment 12,000 down below, and that'll let me know that you guys are interested in me buying a 12,000 XP inverter, connecting it up to a battery stack like this and seeing how long it'll run my house. Because the reality is, for under about $10,000, you can do an entire off-grid setup that requires no permitting, no paperwork, and no hassles with your local government. And you don't even have to use UL listed batteries, which is great because Vader is only about $935 per battery. So it's about $465 less than the competing EG4 battery. So you can effectively buy three Vader batteries for the same price as two EG4 batteries. So if you wanna see that video, comment 12,000 down below. But there's one special trick that makes the off-grid system work so well, and that is not having to use a permanent ground mount for your solar panels. Just by being able to set up your solar panels in your yard, on your back deck, your driveway, or anywhere, you can avoid all of the hassle of doing the permits for your solar. And then by connecting to your house with an interlock switch, you can be completely off grid. I'm gonna put a video right here that'll show you exactly how you can get a portable panel stand working with very affordable solar panels to run your whole house off grid with a system like this. If you need extra help or want to find a system that's gonna be perfect for your setup, just shoot me an email to info at minutemansolar.com.